I did want to talk about this because one of the strengths of the Shaw Festival over those years was this uh, comprehensive aesthetic to yes. the whole entire experience. Yes. From the look on the brochure, to the program, to the garden, to the building, to the mm. play, to the demeanor as it were. And that was a conscious creation of yours? Yes. Yes, it was. So it, how do you do that with the brochure, so to speak? Oh, you, you get the best person you can who fits into your own style, and it was Scott McCowan. And I didn't know that we could afford it, I think, until Elaine Calder said, we've got to do something, when she was general manager for us, said, we've got to do something about this, and we must get Scott in and do it. And I went, all right. I'd known him. And, he turned and do out, you work with Scott, that designer? Mm, yes, that? yes, but you give him a great deal of freedom. I would say, look, what's your idea, Scott? Come up with something for this. And he would come up with a whole range, and I'd go, oh, that's terrific, that's good. And we'd, we'd share it, but it was up to him. It's like actors, you know. I, I, I'm not going to tell you how to necessarily play this part. I, I've cast you because I think you're right for it. Now, what would you do with this? Uh, come on, let's have a go, and I'll help you. And uh, that was my whole thing, I think, to get in the best or the most interesting people that, or who wanted to be there and, and go, okay, challenge us. And I wanted to be challenged. I was always interested in being challenged. By, uh, particularly by directors, which is why I'd bring Tadej Brodetsky in from Poland or something. And when Neil in, the, in Monroe in the 80s was uh, off on his own track, which was really interesting. And so it was a challenge. And uh, I remember... You wanted to be challenged as an actor or an artistic director or as... Everything. All of those. Yes. I wanted ideas. I was greedy for ideas. Just bring me an idea and I'll... If I think it's right and will fit for, it for us, it, 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 come on in. So let's take an example uh, of the Cyrano with uh, Derek Goldby. Yes. Did Derek give you an indication of the kind of bravura or uh, dimension that he was going to put Cyrano yes, in? Yes, but no details particularly. He worked with Cameron Porteous, of course, on the design. And that was, uh, I mean, I trusted Cameron because we'd worked together for many, many years. And I knew that he was listening to Berlioz a lot in his, uh, in his house up in Chautauqua in uh, Niagara-on-the-Lake because the neighbors kept complaining that it was too loud and he kept playing <laughs> music. So I knew where he was going. And I knew the company. And I knew Derek because I brought him out to Vancouver. He'd been an old chum from there. Um, and you just let him go. And sometimes I disagreed with him. I'd been in productions where I disagreed with him and said, can't you do this, this? And he'd go, no, I, I'm trying to get, the, I'd go along with him. And Does wonderful. the artistic director ever step in and go, yes. oh, too far? Yes. Uh, when, when, uh, when is that point? When it's, when it's not competent. Ah. Well, it's not competent. So nothing to do with taste. No. But competence. Well, I suppose, you, 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 I remember saying to Heath, for instance, playing the grave digger, in, uh, uh, when we did a Hamlet in Vancouver, wonderful Hamlet, and you give Heath a lot of space, you always did, it's a great deal. deal. But I remember saying to him at one point after one of his little sort of riffs, Heath, the, la the one thing you cannot do, you cannot shit in Ophelia's grave. That's, that's out. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> that's a matter of tech. Yes, he was exploring, <laughs> you know, having, digging away, and then actually did this whole thing about, oh, wow, and just pulling his pants down. And you go, no, you don't shit in Ophelia's grave. <laughs> so um, there are things like that. And I, I did, oh, a, at least once, I hired a director who wasn't quite up to doing it. Uh, a couple of times I did. And I, I try and help. So, asking Heath not to deliver of himself to Ophelia's grave was aesthetics, or it was inappropriate for the production, or it was artistically... Well, it was inappropriate for the production. It just wouldn't have happened like that, I, I felt. Uh, and it was an aesthetic thing. I, mean, I knew that... And it just wasn't right. It just didn't fit into that production. We weren't doing a right. We're showing the blood. We're showing, you know, mm -hmm. the vileness of this place, and it's all done in the rain. Something like if we were doing a, a very rough and ready kind of Hamlet of showing it in a totally different way. But we weren't. We were doing a, 
uh, we were doing a 19th century castle under siege from Fortinbras, so there was constant booming of guns and fighting and, uh, and rifle fire and people frightened. So to have actually taken it off into, into uh, the gravedigger relieving himself didn't help the long line of this piece. But uh, let's take another example, uh, uh, a Derek Goldby uh, moment at the Cannes stage with a Joe Orton hmm. and a certain amount of uh, cream uh, referring oh, to an yeah. ejaculatory sense. Yeah. Is that, it doesn't sound like aesthetics because it sounds like interesting Joe Orton and yet the artistic director of the theater asked that it be cut. I believe for his audience's feelings. What would I have done in that circumstance? Well, uh, not quite sure. It, 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 it would depend. Knowing Derek, he was, he was pushing at the edges. He always wanted to you know, insult the audience or do something silly. Uh, so, in fact, um, the rows that I had with Derek, and I had a lot of them, were always about that. You know, come on, they've paid the money. You don't, you don't, 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 don't hurt them in that way. Or it's, but I might, I might have gone along with it. Uh, you know, I might have gone along with what he was trying to do. Derek, you, you gave Derek a, quite a lot of leeway. Uh, he was very good. He was just a little mad. Because the atmosphere seems to have changed in our attitude to risk to what we put on stage, and it becomes uh, uh, totally adverse to risking. I mean, if you look yeah. at the programming of theaters here, of the, well, of the major regionals. I think that's what's wrong. I think that's what's gone wrong. It's, it's gone beige. There's, there's good work being done. There really is. There's good acting. There's good design. There's good direction. There are interesting plays out there. but. Um, we, we're not seeing very many theatres that are explosive in terms of what they're doing, either in the method of doing it, uh, which is what I did, was get all these actors together, you know, and out of this would come something interesting and try and, try and program plays that these actors can explode inside and be fascinating. I assume that that risk is not being put on stage or not encouraged by boards and artistic directors for financial reasons, that they're, they're afraid of losing that section of the audience that will not renew their subscriptions. Well, unfortunately, yes, that is basically what it is. But the daring has gone out of it, for instance. I mean, the fact that the board at, uh, or at least the executive at the Shaw, were willing to get rid of me at the end of the second year, you don't find that anymore. You find people being uh, their continued, their artistic leadership, even though things may be going wrong. Boards are nervous about changing horses in midstream. But boards are not hiring daring artistic directors anymore. No, they're not. Unless it's Peter Hinton at NAC. Well, that's, that's a good one, and that's the NAC yeah, hiring. You've got, you've got uh, Peter that's Peter Herndorf reaching between. down saying, I want risk yes, and, in the theater. And it's Peter who I think answers to the board there, so he's got a protection. Right. Uh, Peter Herndorf, not Hinton. My question is, what do we do about it? Well, I don't know what we do, except can you start complaining and shouting about it. I, I, I complain all the time. Come on, get something interesting. Uh, do something more. Uh, you can, and you can do it in so many ways. You can do it with the plays that you put on, with the directors that you use. You, you, can, you can even do it with, with plays which are not going to hurt you, but you do in a different way. Um, I, I'm not sure where the excitement is anymore. Uh, partially this may be me getting older. It does happen though, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. it it's cyclical in terms of what, think of the, the writing in English in the 19th century. Apart from Shaw at the very end, Shaw and then into the 20th, Granville Barker, uh, Hankin. Uh, what you had in the States was Belasco doing, uh, you know, Girl of Golden West and things like that. The writing was, it, it was a bit, it just provided entertainment for the audience for the most part. Wonderful melodramas like, you know, Henry Arthur Jones' The Silver King, which I've done. but. They were, they were just excitements for an audience, you know. They weren't meant to challenge in any way. And you and I came from a, 
uh, a kind of culture of challenge yeah. from the 60s and 70s. There was a kind of sense of challenging ourselves. Uh, and the world was being challenged. It's not, not quite there anymore. I think maybe we're so worried. Uh, are, we, are we so worried by climate change? Is that sort of deep inside us, even though we may not be doing something? Something is happening to the world. So the challenges are somewhere else. Or we don't like looking in the mirror. It could well be that. Give me an exciting time, but please don't make me look in the mirror too deeply. It, it may be that. It's, it's, it's very difficult to, to feel out an audience. I'm glad that I'm not being an artistic director at the moment. I'm not sure how to program. Not now, for this audience. I'm not sure what, what one would put on as a, as, a, as a program, say for Cannes stage, if I was running it, or, or Theatre Calgary, going back to it. What would I put on? What kind of plays? What I do for Calgary? Well, firstly, I'd ask for plays about money, uh, and maybe try and get somebody to write something about the, you know, the tar sands using up all this energy, and that hasn't been addressed. Maybe I'd, I'd go there and try and challenge the audience a little bit with some ideas in that way. I, but I don't know. It should maybe maybe it should go in the way. Now maybe the, you see, I, I always went for the actors. I wanted to build an acting ensemble. Maybe that's the way to go. Maybe I wasn't that wrong, that the actors will lead you. If you have this group of actors who can do these fantastic things, uh, then maybe we'll just go with this group and try and just program for this group. Uh, that's possible. If you have a whole bunch of younger actors, well, what are we dealing with? Uh, you know, uh, we could do... Um, what was that wonderful play that uh, Derek Goldby did about the young boys? Oh, Spring Awakening. Spring Awakening. Maybe, maybe that needs a revival. It was 25 years ago that that was done, mm -hmm. practically, at Cannes stage. Um, if you've got lots of young actors who could do it, that would, something would come off the stage. Mind you, you can go wrong that way, too. I tried to... Uh, one of the not-so-successful productions was The Lord of the Flies that I did at the show, but it didn't work. Perhaps... Perhaps it was the wrong piece for our audience. I hadn't quite thought that through. Our audience, our audience is a nostalgic audience, was at the shore. So what they wanted was nostalgia which connected with them somehow, that you could go, oh, that's very, that's very lovely, that's a very beautiful thing. Oh my God, uh, and just the moment of how she moves the teacup somehow challenged because it seemed so real and what they were doing. I remember, I remember Michael Ball, I gave him a piece of direction at the moment in Hobson's Choice where he's realizing that he's an alcoholic, to take a teacup and, and just play with it with a spoon inside it and the teacup falls over and he still does it and we realized that something very big was happening inside this man, but it was done through just a spoon in a teacup. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's that kind of thing that, that, is, that came from knowing Michael. So I was using an mm -hmm. actor to mm -hmm. find something which connected with the audience, because I remember the audience going absolutely quiet. They knew what was going through in this head somehow.